Okay. Good morning, fellow participants, and good day to those who are logging in from different time zones. Welcome to the third in our series of webinars uh, from IDEV. This webinar is delivered with support from the African Development Institute, ECAD, also of the African Development Bank. Our topic today is the use of evaluation evidence in African legislatures, the role of parliamentary networks. Now, uh, uh, before I, uh, I go on, let me introduce our resource person for today. It's in the person of Ms. Nanuma Kone. She is the APNODE coordinator. APNODE is the African Parliamentary Network on Development Evaluation. Ms. Kone is an evaluation capacity development consultant with the Independent Development Evaluation Unit of the African Development Bank. She joined IDEV after work in the United Nations Environmental Program. She also worked in Rwanda as a coordinator. She holds a master's degree in environmental science with a major in environmental law from the School of Mathematics and Natural Science of the University of Cologne, Germany. She has a bachelor's also in environmental science from Adelaide University in Australia. Ms. Coney, since, uh, since her tenureship in APNODE, she says she's realized the potential of growth in Africa is unlimited if you use parliaments as an entry point for governance, for improving governance and uh, transparency and accountability. Without any further ado, uh, before uh, I, will, uh, I will introduce the resource person, but first of all, a few house rules. Uh, first, I would, I would appreciate it if you all mute your mics. Uh, the resource person has provided time where you will be able to give questions. So mute your mic so that there will be no disturbances. Apart from that, without any further ado, I will introduce you to Nanu, our resource person. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. As Daniel has introduced me, my name is Nanu Kone, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on the use of evidence in African legislatures the role of parliamentary networks. Our case study today will be the African Parliamentarians Network on Development Evaluation with the acronym APNOD, which is the only African parliamentary network that focuses on the promotion of the demand for and use of evaluation by African parliaments and parliamentarians as a use for effective oversight. So, a little bit about myself to add on what Daniel says. I'm currently working at AFDB and with the Department of um, Independent Development Evaluation, whereby I try and coordinate the activities of the APNOT Secretariat. So I will be your host for the next 60 minutes. So in order to get the most of our time today, I would like to strongly encourage you to take notes. So I hope you have a, you've got a pen and a paper around, ask questions. You have, you also have a toolbar that allows you to ask questions. I would also like to encourage you to capitalize on that, as well as note that we are recording this webinar and the greatest advantage of recording the webinar is that you will have time to review the webinar at your own pace. So without further ado, I would also like to just raise one more thing before we start the webinar. That is, um, I will be raising this symbol, giving you an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have or also ask for clarity. So without further ado, let's start the webinar. The webinar is structured as follows. We're going to look at the basic definition of evaluation, look at how supply and demand come in, look at the architecture of parliament government, the role of evidence in parliament and at going further down at the micro level, look at the role of parliamentarians, specifically moving down to parliamentary networks. And for our parliamentary network, our case study today, as you already know, is the African Parliamentary Network on Development Evaluation. We shall look at its theory of change, look at how it has been able to be instrumental in the institutionalization of evaluation successes in various African countries, we shall come to a conclusion and recommendation, further moving down to the area whereby we shall have our questions and answers or any clarity that you may have. So let's start with evaluation. 
As we all know, evidence is paramount to successful policy making. And fortunately, in many African countries, policymakers lack the capacity to effectively access, appraise, and apply research when making decisions. The question therefore lies, what is evidence and what role does it play in effective governance systems, especially at the legislative level, at the legislative level and why do we have an imbalance of in the demand for and supply and evaluation? The OECD defines evaluation as the systematic and objective assessment of an ongoing or completed project, program, or policy, its design, implementation, and results. The aim of evaluation is to determine the relevance and fulfillment of objectives, development efficiency, effectiveness, impact, and sustainability. An evaluation should provide information that is credible and useful, enabling the incorporation of lessons learned into decision-making processes of both recipients and donors. Evaluation also refers to the process of determining the worth or significance of an activity, policy, or program. So having noted that, how does the question of supply and demand come in? So the supply for monitoring and evaluation in Africa has to a large extent been influenced by donor demands that have stimulated the development of the m and &E practice in the absence of national government demands. Even in the most developed countries in the continent where donor contribution is minimal in terms of its influence on the local GDP, evaluators have been trained in a donor-oriented milieu due to the strength of demand from donors and the restricted government system. This issue has been recognized by the African Evaluation Association of Korea in 2017 as well as within the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness. However, it is worth it to know that with the increasing transparency, accountability, and the demand for governance, there has been a paradigm shift, at least at the continental level. And with any paradigm shift, it means that the times are changing with the increased demand for transparency and accountability, resulting in increased demands being placed upon national governments for accountability. This demand is therefore changing the way governments develop and implement policies, as well as how they use information. The rise of endogenous demand for evaluation means that the onus on the government to be more efficient and accountable is on the increase, leading to the surge of the demand for evaluation, previously more complemented by supply. In order, for monitoring systems to make a, for monitoring and evaluation to make a contribution in any effective governance system, there needs to be an increased capacity by governments to demand results oriented monitoring, which involves tracking what they have planned to do or intend to do, and also ask deeper questions of why, how, through evaluation of policies and programs. Two key concepts that require further definition in this section is supply and demand. But prior to that, it's important to know the various stakeholders and to what category of groups they belong to. As you can see in the supply section, we are looking at the evaluation communities, we are looking at universities, think tanks, evaluation networks, and um, consultants, as well as consultancies. Now, in order to fully understand and analyze demand, there's a need to first build an understanding of the overall governance system and the formal and informal influences that actually shape decision making as reflected by countries' policies, planning, and budgetary choices. Decision making further determines is further determined by the nature of any political system, the formalized decision structures, the influence of donors, key decision makers, and other formal and informal influences that shape demand. So, as such, when you look at the demanders of, of evaluation, you're looking at two, the principals and the government agents, with the principal compromising of the executive, legislatures, um, civil society organization development partners, governments, we are looking at the central government, including its ministries and agencies. We are also, here we also have the private sector 
international financial institution and surprisingly the citizens. So we say that there is a demand for evaluation um, when decision makers want to use evidence to assist them in making decisions. And this demand comes either as actual or latent. As such, when demand for evaluation rises when decision makers want to use evidence to assist them in making demand. Latent demand for evaluation arises if the decision maker is not aware that evaluation can be used as a source of evidence. Potential demand rises when there is an awareness for the importance and relevance of evaluation, but resources to fund the evaluation is lacking. And therefore, amongst different interest groups, the configuration of demand may be different. And this also varies in terms or at the continental level. Some countries are latent, some countries have potential demand. And this is as a result of the various degrees of policy structures, planning, and budgetary choices. At the supply side, we say that supply focuses on putting in place people who are trained in evaluation and evaluation results to re uh, research, to collect, capture, and verify data. So those who conduct evaluation on the supply side. Just before we go further, it is important to highlight that today's webinar, we are more or less looking at the demand side of evaluation, because that is where we are seeing a rapid increase and it's extremely important because supply has already been established at the continental level, but demand needs to be able to balance with supply in order to have effective governance. So I would like to use this moment to see if there are any um, questions that you might have. I'm sorry, just one moment, I'm trying to... Um... If there are any questions you might have, you might, uh, this might be the moment to raise them. Thank you very much. Uh, prior to that, may I ask uh, if you have no question, kindly mute the microphone so we can hear the question clearly. Thank you. Thank you. May I kindly request everyone to mute the microphone so we can hear the questions clearly? Does anyone have a question? Okay, so if there are no questions, I am going to um, uh, I'm going to move forward with the second part of the uh, presentation. So. It's important to know that to note that modern democracies one moment. May I ask you, um sorry, if there are no questions, please mute your phone or your laptop. All right, so we shall go on. Okay, so as we all know, modern democracies are characterized by shared decision-making responsibilities by the legislative and executive branches of government. Generally, a country's constitution formally structures its interaction. For legislators to be able to play the role of representation, oversight, and legislation, there needs to be a certain degree of cooperation between the branches in policy making. 
each side must be willing to bargain and compromise in order to get some policy benefits. The legislature must have some capacity to monitor the executive and the executive needs to be willing to comply with legislative enactment. So just like in, when we talk about good governance, we say that good governance is a positive exercise of authority, which is characterized by the citizens' transformation and uh, transformation and participation in governance, control of corruption, political stability, and the respect for the rule of law, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, and effective knowledge management. This cannot be effective if all arms of government do not work together, and it cannot be effective if they do not cooperate together. So whether evidence or information is used appropriately, lack of coordination between the arms of government Will, and between the arms of government will not be able to achieve the governance structure that is needed. So now moving, uh, having seen the arms of government, let's move to the specific role of the parliament. So through the function of legislation, representation and oversight, parliament sits at the center of the web of domestic accountability. They hold the government to account on behalf of the people, ensuring that government policies and actions are both efficient and consumer right with the needs of the public. The role is crucial in checking excesses on the part of the officials that have the mandate to disperse state resources and power. In the, executive, uh, in the executive mandate, parliaments ensure transparency and openness. They hold the executive branch accountable. They provide financial accountability, they make laws, and they uphold the rule of law. And parliament represents the citizens by elected members of parliament. So having seen the three law, uh, the three areas where parliaments work, and that parliament represent the citizens uh, through elected members of parliament, we shall now move down to who the parliamentarians are or the members of parliament. As noted at the World Bank, Members of Parliament are responsible for representing the differences in society and for bridging those differences into the policy-making arena. So the parliamentarian. The parliamentarians are legislators and controllers of the government. In order to fulfill these law-making and oversight roles, they need information. And this is where evaluation comes in. Evaluation is one source of information as it delivers insights about the quality of a policy design, the progress of its, of its implementation, and eventually its final impact of the, on the economy and the society. More often than not, people don't realize that parliamentarians have a large stake in evaluation because in evaluation, they, are, um, they have a large stake in, uh, in evaluation in order to activate different parliamentary instruments. Here we're looking at questions, interpolations, and motions to initiate an evaluation, to monitor an evaluation progress, and to ask concrete evaluation findings. In addition, parliamentarians directly use evaluation knowledge provided to improve their own decision making and to hold government accountable. So even with the role, parliamentarians are unable to achieve the role of, law, of, um, of oversight if they do not have information. And this is where the challenge comes, because since the 1990s, many African parliamentarians remain weak, ineffective, and marginalized, at least in terms of raw power. So what does that mean? It means that at the executive level, unlike legislations worldwide, at the continental level, here I mean we are talking of Africa, there is a huge information asymmetry, or what can be described as the executive monopoly of information. This is because in many cases, government is the only source of information. And when government is the only source of information, the executive cannot hold the government accountable because information is not transparent. And as such, we have an imbalance of power between the legislation and the executive, resulting in weak architectural frameworks. So, um, when you look at the challenges that many African parliamentarians face, we see that this is resulting in inadequate staffing, 
because at the continental level, there's still a lot of work to be done. So parliamentarian face challenges such as inadequate staffing, skills in research and data use. Without information, as mentioned earlier, parliamentarians are unable to carry demand effectively. There's lack of supportive structure at the parliamentarian level, and the evidence is not readily available to members of parliament. Most members of parliament, through the discussion with networks such as AppNodes, have difficulties in getting data because libraries are underfurnished. There's low interest in use of evidence among members of parliament at the political level or also at the personal interest level. And as mentioned earlier, members of parliament cannot effectively exercise their oversight role without credible evidence. Therefore, when we have challenges in using evaluation to conduct effective oversight and we know that parliamentarians need information in order to carry out their activities and these are not there, there needs to be a link between uh, the use of evaluation and the implementation of evaluation. And this is where we have networks coming in because networks the bridge the gap between evaluators who provide the uh, evidence at least at the evaluation level and parliamentarians encouraging parliaments and parliamentarians to institutionalize evaluation or empowering them to warrant evaluation that responds to their needs. So this is what parliamentarian networks such as AppNode focus on, but this is at the evaluation level. However, in general, you would ask, what is a parliamentary network? Well, parliamentary network is the term used in the parliamentary community to describe what other fields called communities of practice or learning networks. So, Parliamentarian networks are formal association, mostly independent, non-government organization of parliamentary institutions or parliamentarians. They are characterized by a set of relationships, personal interactions, and connection between members. Parliamentarian networks provide a platform to parliamentarians and parliament with a specific objective in mind. Parliamentary networks often advocate for increased accountability and transparency in a specific domain. Here it ranges broadly. It can come from human rights to women's rights, evaluation, corruption, etc. So having that, what are the commonalities that are faced by most parliamentary networks? They all have some common features, which is some design features that are similar. First, they are made by a, a, a group of people who share the same interests, and this time you're looking at parliaments, and this could be parliaments that are active or inactive parliamentarians, that who are parliam uh, these are considered as parliamentarians who are previously in parliament but are no longer in parliament. They usually have a purpose and objective or a mission, and to some extent, a degree of formality. Most of them can start informally, but eventually over time, they become formal institutions. They are usually run by secretariat and usually have an annual general meetings that brings all the members together. There is some form of leadership, and this varies depending on the, uh, on the type and the uh, degree of formality of the network. They're usually self-organized or are sponsored. Sorry, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> um, prior to moving to the question area, one more thing I would like to highlight is the role of parliamentary network. We've already seen that first we have parliaments and then we have parliamentarians and that there's a deficit in regards to how parliamentarians can be able to achieve their activities. And this is where parliamentarian networks come in because they bridge the gap between the parliament, the citizens, and their objective. They bridge the gap between the parliamentarians to achieve their objective with the development partners. How do they do this? How do they boost the capacity of parliamentarians to allow them to achieve their objectives, whichever the mission is? When you're looking at parliamentary networks that focus on evaluation, a network such as AppNode, we are looking at there's a mission of increased evidence use at the parliament and at the parliamentarian level. And how is this achieved? It is achieved by building the capacity. That is by having capacity building or capacity development initiatives that's focusing on training, workshop, e-learning and conferences. That we are looking at facilitating evidence dissemination through peer learning. 
developing evidence information behavior to institutionalization, enhancing reciprocal learning, as well as creating awareness. And over time, as I have mentioned, the parliamentary networks move from informal to formal, and most of the time they're formal. So over time, the legitimacy of parliaments, uh, parliamentary network increases, and as the network broadens, as their influences broaden. So at the moment, if there are any, time, any, any questions, this will be the time. Do you have any questions? Um, you can ask questions as long as you unmute your, your, are there any questions? Okay, I would like to assume that it's uh, moving well and that everything is clear. However, please note we will have another session for questions. So. Please note down your questions and I will be happy to answer them. So um, to move forward, so we do not lose any time, I would like to go to the next um, phase of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, so um, so we shall move to the next phase of the presentation, which is now the thing we've moved now from the macro level, looking at the legislation, we've looked at government, we look at parliaments and parliamentarians. Now the micro level we are looking at, we've also looked at parliamentary networks. So now let's delve down into what parliamentary networks such as APNO do. The, uh, and how Upnode is an example of what several of the parliamentary networks do, but perhaps the mandate may not be specifically focused on evaluation. However, it provides a broader, in, um, uh, a broader view as to what wider parliamentary, parliamentary networks do. So Upnode was launched in March 2014 at the 7th African Evaluation Association Conference that was held in Yaoundé, Cameroon. APNOT works towards enhancing the capacity of both parliaments as institutions and African parliamentarians as individuals to improve their oversight, policy making, and national decision making roles. This is done by using multiple activities for bridging the gap between evaluators who provide the evidence and parliamentarians, encouraging parliamentarians and parliaments to institutionalize evaluation and empowering them to warrant evaluation that responds to their demands. As I mentioned earlier, most parliamentary networks have a vision, a mission, they have principles, they have stakeholders, and most of the time they are formal institutions. So, APNOD as a formal institution, of course, because it has a constitution, we have democratically elected members, works with both institutions, as mentioned earlier, we are, we are talking about the parliament and individuals for whom credible and impartial evidence and what does and doesn't work is crucial. By facilitating opportunities, training opportunities and the use of evaluation by parliamentarians in their roles in creating an enabling environment for evaluation networks such as APNO to not only promote an evaluation culture in regional member countries of the African Development Bank, because here we are talking of the African Development Bank, whereby APNO is hosted by the Independent Development Evaluation Department. Um, this is one of the evaluation capacity initiative, uh, development initiatives. But APNO also endeavors to build the aptitude of parliamentarians as policy makers to effectively engage in a strategic and meaningful manner in the national evaluation processes, and hopefully leading to an efficient evidence-based decision, decisions and policies that are equity-focused and evidence-based. 
So we can see we've met, looked at the principal values. We've looked at the stakeholders. I've said it works with institutions. But other than institutions, you're looking at parliamentary, uh, parliamentary networks who work with various other stakeholders in order to have an effective and broader impact. And here we are going to discuss some of these, or you're going to see some of these when we're looking at the app nodes theory of change. So when you look at the app node theory of change, you should see that at the center here, this, at the center of the theory of change are parliamentarians and parliaments. Parliamentarians have the capacity through the support from app node. Uh, and their tripartite role as lawmakers, conductors of oversight and representatives of citizens to advocate for wider use of evaluation as evidence in national decision making, legislate for a conducive environment for evaluation, create demand for and make use of evaluation as part of oversight and engage with the citizens, civil society organizations, and other development partners and other stakeholders in both the demand and supply area to provide stronger and more accountable links between citizenry, the citizens and the executive. And through positive engagement, such interaction over time have the potential to lead to greater use of evidence, of, uh, sorry, to greater use of evaluation as evidence within African parliaments, stronger evaluation systems that are embedded within the legislation in African states, a more robust relationship between the legislator and executive and the production of policy based on evidence, a stronger and more accountable democratic system and greater development effectiveness for inclusive growth in the continent. So basically from this, from the broader level, we move to the micro level with the overarching goal of greater inclusive development at the continental level. So, what can we say are the achievements of APNOT to date? Well, the achievements are several. To date, let me, we shall just look at this year point 2017 because APNOT has been in existence for the last uh, three years. So we are looking, four years, we are looking at 2017, just the most recent achievements because prior to that, APNOT was really structuring and developing itself. However, to date, Oh, last year, 2017 alone, APNO trained more than 100 parliamentarians on various evaluation themes, such as championing national evaluation policies and systems, whereby parliamentarians and parliament's capacities in strengthening national monitoring evaluation systems were enhanced to allow for evaluating sustainable development goals with the no one left behind lens through equity focused and gender responsive evaluation methodologies. Parliamentarians were also trained on the use of evaluation to capacitate them to be champions of national evaluation by creating an enabling environment for ECD evaluation capacity development in their respective countries and use of evidence-based evaluation in their decision-making processes. Uh, and use of development <laughs> in their decision-making processes. In addition, Workshops such as the role of stakeholders in evaluation has enabled parliaments and parliamentarians to work with various stakeholders. Here we are looking at evaluators, we are looking at VOPs, uh, we are looking at civil societies, donors in relation to evaluation in order to fulfill, uh, in order to influence evaluation at the national level. So we can see APNOT alone has been able to have three AGM annual general meetings. As I, I mentioned earlier, formal uh, parliamentary networks do have AGMs whereby this is the annual meeting where all the members come together to share information, to share knowledge, to transfer knowledge, to learn and to build their capacity. And they have, we, uh, APNOT has a democratic process. And since its, uh, since its uh, inception in 20, 2014, the membership has increased from parliamentarians from seven countries to parliamentarians from 19 countries with 11 national chapters established. The network has a strategic plan and action plan that, is, uh, that has been costed, uh, sorry, a work plan that has been costed and a communication strategy. And now the network, due to its mandate, due to its focus, due to its, um, due to its objective to really increase the use of uh, evaluation for effective uh, policy making, it has gained in terms of influence by having 
three countries uh, parliament being members as really like as associate members. So here we are looking at the parliament of Zimbabwe, Sudan and Benin. And also its interaction with other bodies such as UMWA, COMESA, with the Global Parliamentarian Forum of Valuation and the Southern Parliament, uh, Parliamentary Forum. APNOT is trying to build awareness and it's trying to work with other institutions in order to really delve further into bridging the gap between supply and demand at the continental level. And its strong membership established with the African Development Bank, the uh, Clear AA, which is the Center for Learning and Research, UN Women, UNICEF, and the African Evaluation Association, Réseau Francophone for Evaluation, and Evaluation Partners. It means that the network and the capacity that African parliamentarians get for being members of the network is significantly high. So that's all beautiful, but however, there have been challenges. So you're asking, yes, we've had beautiful successes, we had great successes, but what are the challenges that the network faces? And I can assure you that most of the challenges you're gonna to hear today is actually most of the challenges that most parliamentary networks, at least in Africa, face, regardless of their mission or their objective. So one of the biggest one, of course, and the highest one resource mobilization. That is because a significant number of donor organizations and institutions do not fund parliamentary networks directly as most funding is directed to country offices who disperse the funds. The issue with such funding modality is that it's not flexible for parliamentary networks whose members come from multiple countries. Secondly, donor organizations have priority countries where most of their funding is channeled to. And this further hinders the chances of multi-country partnership networks that need support in order to grow and attract parliamentarians and parliaments to be vested in development evaluation. In many countries, there is still exclusive reliance on external expertise, which results in evaluation that are inapplicable, no matter how technically sound, due to the absence of an organic link to administrative operators. Attracting and keeping parliamentarians and parliaments to evaluation has been a major challenge. This lies predominantly with the slow progress in the demand for evaluation, and in African countries accepting development evaluation as an important tool for effective policy and decision making to foster good governance. Evaluation is not easily accepted by many parliamentarians due to various political reasons, such as, as, uh, such as systematic alignment with the views of government in place. So even if parliaments have robust power, uh, power on paper, the political realities inside and outside parliament make them regularly fail to exercise their duties. Another challenge that, we've, uh, that APNOT has realized is that parliamentarians suffer a high turnover rate due to the electoral nature of their office, such that when the capacity of one parliamentarian has been boosted, as soon as that parliamentarian is removed from being a member of parliament through um, activities such as election, that capacity becomes lost. So the issue of sustainability has been extremely difficult. And when that becomes difficult, it means that institutional structure at the, at the parliamentary level is not really well maintained, it's not well established. And this, this has been one of the reasons why parliamentary networks now not only focus on the individual, but they also try and focus on the institution, which is the parliament, in order to enhance that, to enhance this notion of sustainability and institutional memory. So at the, at, the, uh, at the level of the organization, there has been a lot of successes, but at the, inst at the level of institutionalization, at the level of parliament, what successes has networks such as have not been able to do? Through the encouragement and facilitation of good practices and lessons learned by parliament and parliamentarians and encouraging parliament and parliamentarians to see the objective, the usefulness and the importance of using tools such as evaluation for better oversight, We've had evaluation units formed within parliaments as well as, yeah, as well as evaluation being really recognized in parliaments. We, for example, uh, in Togo, not only has the APNO national chapter been able to, uh, to, has been able to, to be established, but also at the national level, evaluation policy, uh, an evaluation policy has been established. So is a ministry in charge of evaluation. And the APNO Togolese chapter engages with the Speaker of Parliament to ensure that evaluation is a concept in Parliament. 
In Uganda, parliamentarians actively demand for the Office of Prime Minister to make periodic reports to members of parliament and evaluation and recommendation by evaluators. And Uganda, being one of the uh, APNOD members with a very strong national chapter, uh, we see that um, current and perspective APNOD members actually look, uh, APNOD members and chapters actually look at Uganda as an exemplary model of how effective evaluation can be used by policymakers at the parliamentary level, as well as how effective evaluation can be in ensuring decisions made based on evidence. Networks such as APNOD provide the facility through which members Member countries from Africa can learn from each other on how to engage with parliament to using e development evaluation at the parliamentary level. For example, in Zimbabwe, after their participation at the first APNOD AGM that was held in Abidjan in 2015, the members of parliament passed a motion in parliament that, that was tabled and debated, leading to the establishment of APNOD chapter at the Zimbabwean parliament. Because the chapter is based at the parliament, it has been able to successfully sensitize not only APNOD members, but all members of parliament. We have places like Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Benin, and Uganda, who all have APNOD members and some have APNOD chapters. The parliamentarians have been able to get, uh, to get capacity building through training, enhancing their monitoring evaluation tools, and also how to pass motion, how to be able to evaluate policies using an m and uh, overview. So APNOD has currently been, is currently being recognized with all its partnership, with all the achievements, with its objective in ensuring that evaluation is used for effective governance for the citizens of Africa, is really recognized as an institution evaluation. Um, and in Africa, it is the only Pan-African parliamentary network that focuses on evaluation. And this recognition is really becoming more and more pertinent as the network grows. So to conclude, we can see that for evaluation to be effective in Africa, at the national level, at the continental level, there needs to be, it needs to be actively used and promoted at the institutional level. Parliamentary interventions in promoting the use of evaluation and exercising its mandate at the legislative level expands parliamentarians and parliament's ability to maneuver with development evaluation as a key instrument used to gain insight in the corporate connect in the conception progress and results of policy parliaments have the direct responsibility for putting evaluation on the political agenda since evaluation of legislations is more often than not triggered by parliaments whereby it demands evaluation through a parliamentary procedural request it is paramount at least from the up north secretariat point of view that both parliament and parliamentarians work together to use evaluative knowledge for policy development and governance decision, both at the micro and macro level. And this is one of the activities that networks such as APNO try and bridge the, uh, try and bridge the gap from. In essence, parliaments can stimulate both the demand and supply of, evalu of evaluation, as well as contribute to an enabling environment for evaluation by ensuring that latest legal frameworks are in place and by advocating for evaluation. And this has been done by some of the uh, APNOT members' countries, whereby they have been able to institutionalize evaluation in their constitution. We are looking at Cote d'Ivoire, we are looking at Senegal and Benin that have been able to achieve this successfully thanks to their involvement in with networks such as APNOT and their active participation in all the capacity building initiatives that the network has to offer. So today, what is our, what is APNOT's recommendation? In the recommendation is that at the continental level, evaluation capacity development journey has just begun. As parliamentary networks continue their efforts with the support of development partners to promote an evaluation culture at the continental level by strengthening national monitoring and evaluation systems, by establishing regional networks and communities of practice, by establishing evaluation platforms and strengthening national and regional evaluation association, there is a strong possibility that the architecture needed for sustaining evaluation may start to take hold. But this will only succeed if it is pulled by all actors, both inside and outside parliament and not just by parliamentary networks. That means parliamentary networks alone, no matter how effective, 
how efficient, how lack of resources they have cannot push the mandate of, uh, of effective legislation alone. There has to be really a demand of evaluation and the capacity of both the parliament and the parliamentarians needed to be boosted in order to demand for evaluation and apply the, uh, and apply the evaluation demanded. So UpNote experience shows that development evaluation and evaluation capacity development support must address both the supply and the demand side evaluation. And that users of evaluation, that is the parliament and parliamentarians, have an interest in development evaluation. However, taking note that although there are challenges such as lack of financial support, lack of institutional and human capacity, opportunities offered by the parliamentary network really needed to be profited upon. So if you have any questions, this will be the moment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nanu, for that scintillating presentation on the use of evidence by Parliament. Indeed, you have drawn the link between demand and the supply evaluation, the use of evidence to Parliament, as well as to parliamentary networks. She's using her experience with UpNode as a case study. Now, for the questions, maybe I will begin. From your experience with uh, UpNode, could you maybe uh, just uh, share with us an example of a country that is progressing in the use of evaluation or through, through parliamentary networks? And maybe just an example or so of the impact of that use of evidence. Um, thank you, Daniel, for that question. One of the countries I would say is actually Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire recently um, included evaluation in their constitution. And with that, uh, we've also seen the UpNote chap local chapter in Cote d'Ivoire in, in early this year being able to train more than 60 parliamentarians on the use of evaluation on the use of evaluation at the, at, the, uh, at the country level. And we can see that a lot of motion, at least based on what we are, the information we are getting from the local UpNote chapter, the chair has informed us that since the training of the, uh, of the 60 members of parliament in the role of evaluation and evaluation tools, um, more motions have been passed in parliament that are actually based on evidence that are actually more precise and more concise. And because of that, he's actually seeing a significant number of uh, Ivorian parliamentarians asking whether they could join the network in order to capitalize on the training opportunities, the capacity building, the knowledge sharing that the network actually um, provides. Hi, Nanu. Hello. <laughs> In, uh, in your, your slide on conclusions, um, you said that uh, donors should recognize the relevance of uh, parliamentarian networks. Uh, what, what can we do, or what, what, yeah, what can be done to, uh, to achieve that, uh, that recognition by donors? Um, thank you, Karen, for your question. I think one of the things that can be done uh, uh, for us actually needs to come from donors. One of the things is that donors no longer see evaluation, at least at the continental level, as being extremely pertinent because there has been this paradigm shift of evaluation from a purely donor base to an activity or a tool that's more importantly used at the government level. One of the things is that donors need to realize that for every resources they provide countries, for all the funding they provide countries, governments are really take, uh, uh, have a vested interest in that. And for their resources to be used effectively, there needs to be some form of evaluative thinking that goes in that. So one of the first things that donors need to realize that evaluation is not just a standalone activity. It's something that is embedded in all the activities of a country. And that when, once we have that recognition, I think donors first will be much more open to the idea of funding parliamentary networks. And the other thing is that parliamentary networks um, need also really to, 
to communicate a lot with donor institutions in their respective countries and also that one of the things parliamentary institutions, uh, parliamentary networks such as APNO to do is to use their own, uh, mem uh, their own networks, their members, to also support them um, in terms of advocacy, um, in bringing them up, in terms of how donors will be able to see them. So basically, it's not something just that the Secretariat of APNO does or the Secretariat of Parliamentary Networks, but rather also APNO members or members of parliamentary networks need to have a vested interest in ensuring that donors actually see the value in funding parliamentary networks to achieve the objective of evaluation and also in to achieve the objective of all the projects and resources they'll be putting in a specific country. I don't know if that has been able to answer your question. Yeah, no, I fully agree that, that uh, parliamentarians on the ground are, are probably best placed to, to sensitize the donors in their countries. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, of course, having a public function, they should be used to public speaking, but indeed, they may, they may need to strengthen their capacities to advocate uh, a bit. Yes, that's true. Are there any other questions? Hi, Nanu. Hello. Uh, this is Magda. Um, thank you very much for that uh, very informative uh, presentation. My question, I have two questions. Uh, you noted the, the challenge of high turnover of parliamentarians, and you noted that uh, you are focusing on uh, the institutions so that uh, the institutional memory is retained. Probably maybe you could shed some light on some of the mechanisms and strategies that you are applying to, to get that going, especially looking at the knowledge management principles. Then secondly, uh, there is a lot of focus on capacity building of uh, the uh, parliamentarians within uh, APNOD uh, and maybe uh, in the spirit of showcasing the evidence, um, it would be interesting to hear uh, how you have been capturing the, the impact or the difference that uh, the, the, the various capacity building uh, um, activities are ending in the network. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Magda, for your question. Um, I will, I'll start with the capacity building one. How are we capturing this? We actually capture this because most of the capacity building initiatives, as the Secretariat, we have a broader overview of all the capacity building initiatives that are happening, both at the ground level, which, which is by national, uh, up not national chapters, but also uh, uh, being in the web of knowledge and being in the web of, uh, of all the other development partners that work with evaluation, we are able to provide this evaluation. Um, uh, we are able to provide a lot of information to both parliamentarians in regards to where, how, and when they can be able to get capaci uh, added capacity building activities by A, funding for some of the workshops that they are attending, partially funding them and also providing them letters of recommendation to attend uh, those, those capacity building or training workshops and events. And how do we know that these are having an impact? We know these are having an impact because as you've seen in one of the slides, uh, one of the previous slides, the network started uh, with uh, parliamentarians from seven countries. Now the network has parliamentarians from about uh, 19 countries. So this means that as uh, the more and more popular the network becomes, and here we're not just talking of popularity in terms of popularity context, but how uh, parliamentarians are able to view the added value of being an APNOD member has seen the increase of the membership from seven, from originally parliamentarians from seven countries to 19 countries. This shows that with word going out and with more APNOD representatives are showing and broadcasting the importance, the relevance, the knowledge gained by being an APNOD member is actually starting to take root. However, on your question on institutionalization, how we manage the knowledge management, again, it's through training, it is through peer learning, it is having depository, um, uh, success stories. Um, whenever uh, APNOT has an opportunity to give that information out to say the importance, the relevance, the, 
the challenges, risks, and opportunities in evaluation at the continental level, it is taken. And uh, this has really been able to uh, assist the network really uh, gain ground. I don't know if that has been able to answer your question. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Nanu. Any other questions? Hi, Nanu. Hello. This is Eustace. Hello, Eustace. I was, um, uh, thank, you for, thank you for the presentation. In relation to Karen's comments on the need to improve um, the advocacy skills of parliamentarians, I was wondering whether receiving training as, um, as the network do in the same space we see as it will make any difference. I'm wondering your thoughts on that. Thank you, Eustace, for the, quest, uh, uh, for the question. I think that in terms of increasing advocacy tools to capacity, uh, improving advocacy uh, of the network to capacity building is actually very important and it is a pertinent link. The reason for that is that you cannot advocate something you don't know. So you need to have the knowledge in order to go and advocate for anything. And we can see that, uh, as, I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned earlier, using uh, the question that Mark asked, the more knowledge they gain, the more confident they are, even in passing motions in parliament, the more confident they become in reviewing their own policies and in questioning the government. So this is also this kind of knowledge this kind of confidence is what actually makes an advocacy tool much more effective. So I always believe that without knowledge and which is something that capacity building brings in, you cannot really advocate. So I'm not so sure whether I uh, answered that question. Are there any other questions? Are there, are there any other questions? We have about two minutes before we close the webinar. All right, so prior to closing the webinar, um, I would like to share one more thing. Of course, there are references to these, uh, uh, to this, uh, to the webinar and to the resources just to inform you for this webinar. And lastly, I would like to inform you that um, AppNode Secretariat, of course, is available for further information. And if you have any question, please look at the Independent Development uh, um, Department website of the African Development Bank. There are a lot of information in regards to the role of the bank in uh, monitoring and supply of evaluation. And it, it, as well as the supply aspect and demand of evaluation, the various projects that focuses a lot on the demand aspect of evaluation. There's also our website on the African, um, African Parliamentary Network and with contacts to the network. If you have any uh, queries, if you have any questions, if you'd like to collaborate with us, we are open for that as well. So please do look at the website of IDE for further information. And without further ado, I would like to close the website, uh, the webinar. Thank you, Nanu, for a very wonderful presentation. We will apologize to our participants for some of the technical pitches. I think the internet was a bit unstable at times, so the sound quality wasn't so good. We, you, you will hear from our next webinar, the fourth in our series of knowledge sharing platforms will be advertising you. We are grateful for your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, see you next time for the next webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nanu. Bye. Thank you for joining. Bye.